Thank you, everybody. Um, can I say, my name is Richard Wilson. <clears throat> I'm the event director of the Global Security Challenge. Um, what I'd like to do is just tell you a, a little bit about us and then a little bit about what's going to happen today uh, and what you're going to see. Uh, and then get off the stage as quickly as possible because I'm conscious that we're uh, running a, a behind schedule. Um, the GSC was started in 2006 by uh, two graduates from the London Business School. And their vision was to empower entrepreneurs uh, to be, if you like, the, uh, uh, the linkage between startups and small SMEs into the mainstream market. And uh, what, we, what we've done really is, is, is since that time, as, as you've heard from uh, Gideon, who was in this situation last year, uh, we've raised over $80 million for uh, uh, regional finalists in the GSC. Uh, since that time. Uh, in addition, we, we've also seen some of our regional finalists uh, be acquired by major organizations. Only uh, two weeks ago, uh, a company called uh, TenCube, who were an Asian region finalist, uh, were bought by McAfee for $28 million. Uh, and we don't count the purchase prices in our $80 million of investment. So we really have been, a, a, if you like, a uh, a good source for, for startups and SMEs to, to develop and, and go through the process. Um, what, I, what I'd like to do now is tell you what you're going to see for the rest of the program today um, and tell you a little bit of how those contestants have actually got to this stage. Uh, in March of this year, we opened uh, the 2010 Global Security Challenge. Uh, it is truly a global uh, challenge. We, we hold uh, regional finals all around the world. We've uh, John and I have just come back from the USA where we held uh, three regional finals. Uh, we've also been to Singapore where we held the Asian regional final. And through that process, we have already uh, secured nine finalists uh, for the grand final, which is held in November in London uh, every year. Uh, today we have eight uh, presentations for you, four startups and four SMEs. Um, of which two from each category, so four in total, will join the previous nine uh, at the final in London. Um, we, as I said, we opened this competition in March, and the first round of judges is uh, judging is uh, has already taken place. Uh, so it's an enormous achievement for all of the companies that have got through to this stage of the competition, uh, because the competition is getting ever. Uh, harder and uh, more sophisticated each year that we run this challenge. Um, so I'm hopeful and I'm confident that you will see uh, eight presentations today of new disruptive technology that will absolutely amaze you, uh, that you will wonder how people invent these things and uh, develop these things. And uh, I'm sure that is exactly what's going to happen. Uh, we'll start through with the presentations from the uh, startups, and then we'll have a coffee break, and then we will do the uh, SMEs. Uh, each one of them has got uh, a maximum slot of 10 minutes. Uh, so contestants, if you can uh, make sure you keep to that. Uh, once all the presentations have finished, there's another panel later on this morning, which you can all participate in. But at that point, all the uh, judges and all the contestants We'll, we'll be going upstairs to a private room where the judges can uh, examine their, their entry and their innovation in a little bit more detail in private. And then we do all come back here and you will see the announcement of the winners uh, this afternoon. Um, before we bring up the first contestant, I've got a few thank yous. Um, it's, we, if we didn't have the support of uh, open-minded and uh, innovative companies such as Accenture, uh, Oh, the Office of Naval Research and uh, particularly Tiswig, uh, we wouldn't be able to bring this competition to everybody. Uh, it truly is a global competition. As you've heard, we've got finalists this year from all over America, uh, from Canada, from uh, Africa and uh, Singapore, Australia. We also have, um, you know, as you're, you're now going to see, uh, a large number of companies from Israel pitching and also from mainland Europe. 
So it really is uh, the best technology, the most innovative, the most disruptive in the security arena that uh, you're going to see. Uh, but if I can just also thank uh, our judges for their time, uh, you know, they give their time freely, and uh, to that we're really, really grateful for. Uh, I'd like to thank Davidy and his team. This has been, I, I'm, I haven't had a chat with uh, John yet, but I'm sure he'll agree with me that this has been the best organised, uh, the most well attended, the most enthusiastic um, regional final we've held. And I think that is all down to Davidy and his team and the efforts of the MIT Enterprise Forum of Israel. Uh, so we're really delighted to be here. Uh, and it's fantastic for the SMEs and the startups to have such an enthusiastic audience in front of them. Probably make them a little bit more nervous, but uh, who knows, we'll, we'll find out in a minute. How many countries uh, Oh, several hundred, several hundred. Uh, uh, no, not in Israel, worldwide, worldwide. In Israel, I think it was something in the region of 50. Um, we run, it's a good question, we run uh, obviously the GSC every year, but we also run uh, some civilian versions of uh, challenges. Uh, you, if you go to our website, you can see that there's things like cyber and cloud, energy storage, uh, all sorts of things. So, uh, you know, just check out our website for if, you, if you're not in maybe the security arena or you've got technology that, that drifts into secondary or tertiary areas, have a, have a look on the website. You may find uh, uh, competitions that are particularly targeted at your technology. Um, so you're going to see uh, eight presentations. We'll start with the startups. Uh, uh, as I said, I've just finished thanking David and his team. It, uh, it's really, really daunting to stand up here with so many people, and ministers and all people that I see on the television. It's quite, quite amazing. Um, our first presentation is uh, a company called BriefCam. Uh, we're going to come up on the stage now. They've got to set up uh, uh, their laptop on the computer, so there'll be a tiny delay while we do that. Uh, but I wish all of our startups and SMEs the very best of luck in getting through to our final in London. Uh, I hope you'll be amazed at the technology you'll see. And um, good luck to our contestants. Thank you very much. I wish uh, to uh, support uh, Richard's uh, compliments to the video. He's really done a great job. And uh, Richard will continue moderating this part of the program when the companies uh, present. Uh, we are 20 minutes off schedule, I'm afraid, which means everything is delayed by 20 minutes. Please be patient. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Uh, I'm Dori Rani, uh, the CEO of Briefcom, and uh, I'm happy to be here. We only got five minutes, actually, originally, so I'll try to be fast. Uh, video is everywhere. We see it in airports, in train stations, in hospitals. We see it at work. I tried to look for something here, but this is the only one I got here. Still, the academy. Uh, and it's actually getting into homes. Uh, the number of cameras that are being sent out, shipped every day, is amazing. 11 million in 2009, growing up to 24 million in 2014. Lots of sensors, lots of video out there. I think people can hear me. Guys, people are now watching video. You know how much video is now being recorded? Nobody is seeing it because they're talking about sensors. Anyway. This is the typical uh, environment that we are used to see. People sitting in front of monitors and watching, uh, watching video surveillance all day. Very boring. As the market is expanding, we see more and more people. They don't even bother to sit in front of their uh, uh, cameras. They actually want to see the video on their mobile away when they're at here or when they're at work. 
There are not enough files to watch it all. So what do we do? Briefcam tried to cope with it by providing video synopsis. It's a technology that was originally uh, developed in the Hebrew University and was commercialized by, uh, by Briefcam, and it allows to you to browse hours in minutes. On the left-hand side, if you can see, you can see there. So on the left-hand side, uh, what you see here is the airport in Stuttgart, 24 hours in an airport. When you see on the right-hand side is one minute, depicting all the events that actually took place at that time, at that day, in Stuttgart. And that actually, uh, what you can see here is all the events that took place uh, in, uh, in the airport. Obviously, it was never, uh, the scene that you're seeing here never took place in reality. But if you pick the events that you're interested in, you actually are able to index back to the original video and thus see exactly what uh, you're looking for in a very quick uh, way. How does it work? Uh, let's look at the club. It's a pool club, nine hours. People are playing. What we are doing is actually we're extracting all the moving objects from the uh, original video and put it in a database. As you can see, in the database there are players from different times, 9 a.m. all the way up to 10 p.m. at night. When someone asks for a summary for a certain hour or a certain period of time, we'll do it for the whole uh, uh, nine hours. What we're able to do using uh, uh, motion, uh, uh, sorry, video analysis techniques is to compact everything uh, in uh, less than 30 seconds. And uh, 30 seconds. And this way, you actually see, this is the end result. If you can see, uh, I don't know if everybody here can see, uh, at the bottom you can see all the players that actually were uh, in that club during those uh, nine hours. Luckily, nobody was dancing on the table. This is packaged in, in two product lines today. The first one is targeting those who are sitting behind monitors. And if someone sits behind a monitor and wants to uh, detect an event, typically, by the way, an event takes about 20 minutes from the time it starts up to the time it closes, he's able to, uh, he or she is able to uh, uh, monitor it using uh, a video summary. Another uh, packaging is towards people who want to see it after the fact, not only in Dubai, but in Times Square and every, place, uh, every other place. What they're actually interested, they know what they're looking for, but they have lots of uh, video to, to search for. For example, if we're looking at this uh, car at 1323, as you see, timestamps are available as well, and we click on that, we're able to see the original movie. <coughs> and here, it's a car in a parking lot. Someone will come out of that car. And uh, this is what we were looking for. This is ubiquitous technology. It allows you to target many markets. In the security markets, obviously, Homeland Security, forensics, and public safety, which is uh, really picking up. When you deal with enterprises, they're really targeting liability. They want to reduce their uh, risk. They want to make sure that they're liable to as less as possible events that actually took place within their responsibility. When you go further down to uh, consumers, you're talking about lifestyle. People would like to see their old mother at home to make sure she is okay. People would like to share uh, information. They have to watch their kids at home. Um, and they would like to simply share bits and pieces of information between them and upload them to YouTube. When you have an hour of video, you only want to pick the one minute that is interesting and, uh, and put it up on the internet. And that's possible as well with uh, video synopsis. The company. We started in 2008, as I said, patents were developed by uh, the Hebrew University. Professor Shmuel Peleg is part of the uh, co-founders of the company. In the first year, we packaged the technology into products and we signed, uh, we signed uh, deals with uh, first uh, leading uh, partners in the area of uh, IP video and video surveillance. 2010 is actually dedicated to uh, starting sales and going outside. And as people mentioned here, it's a big challenge for, me, for an Israeli company. But also, we are quite lucky because we were acknowledged by leading um, organizations in the world. I think the only one I want to share with you right now is that only last week, we were depicted by the Wall Street Journal to be the most innovative company in physical security for 2010. And this is not only a startup uh, uh, competition. Our plans to sell a lot. Five years, $40 million, $20 million uh, uh, profit. How is that going to be achieved? And this is part of the reason I'm here, because many of 
of the people sitting here are potential partners. We are looking for partners. We only sell indirect. Uh, all our partnerships are branded. People know about Briefcom. And we sell in two models. We sell in products, but we sell also in services because the market is moving towards subscriptions. To sum up, one ubiquitous technology, you can deal with different video sources, different packaging. It can be on different platforms. Amit is here. Where is Amit? Amit can show you uh, uh, how a uh, video synopsis uh, can look on an iPhone, can look on an iPad. The reason we're using that is because Steve Jobs has done a wonderful job, and video just looks wonderful on those uh, uh, little toys. Uh, thank you very much. And within the five minutes, do I have do I have more time? No, no, not really. Okay, okay we're guys. Running time. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, startup is um, uh, another company from Israel. It's IDU Biometrics. Uh, if you could come up. Where's our file? Uh, where's our file come? Ah, there we go. Which one have you done? Uh, ID. ID. Right. Oh, ID. That one? That one. This one. Should we get you a bit bigger? Uh, which way do we do that? Is it this one? No. If you have this, by the way, you've got it uh, on the other screen as well. So. Oh, okay. Where's the, the just, just the, the mouse? Yeah. No, no. I just just press that. Just press that one. That one. Okay. Yeah. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Daphna Palti Wasserman, and I'm representing IDU Biometrics. I want to introduce to you today our innovative technology with, with, that deals with identification, but not just ident identification, 4D biometrics. And you haven't heard that one before. Actually, that's it. But since I do have about nine more minutes, I will go in and explain, and so you can understand what you saw here. Our technology is stimulus-driven. What does that mean? It means a user watches a stimulus on a display, and while he's watching the visual stimulus, his response, his eye movement patterns are acquired by a camera. Both stimulus and response are used to crea create the user's identification signature using IDU's propriety algorithms. These algorithms, are, of, of course, are uh, patented, but our patent is much more stronger. The patent is on the whole concept of the stimulus response identification process, and it's uh, been submitted worldwide. You have already seen the stimulus. Let's look for a moment what, what I mean when I say eye movement patterns. On the left, you can see the eye movement patterns of you. It's in blue. That, a jittery line. On the right side, I will show you the eye movement of me. Okay? So, as you can see, they're, ve they're, ve they're very different. IDU uses the fact that each of us has unique eye movement patterns, and from these unique eye movement patterns, we create uh, identif identification signature for each of us. This is why I can say that you'll never be me. Why eye movements? Well, eye movements are influenced by many factors. They're influenced by the eye anatomy, the eye physiology, the stimuli itself, that's what you saw at the beginning, and about on the subject's characteristics. All these together create a signal which is so rich and gives us so much information about the identity and other stuff. Just for comparison, if we're talking about fingerprint, for example, there you're just using specific anatomical features of the finger. So you understand that eye movement is a whole rich world which, which can give us so much in so many ways. 
Well, that's the concept. How do you take this amazing and scientific concept and transform it into a working reality? Well, that's what we did in IDU. The first step was a comprehensive authentication study. It's uh, based on a PC uh, benchmark prototype in our laboratory, and we have uh, collected data during more than two years. We have a uh, very uh, we have male, female people with glasses, uh, lenses, ages from uh, eight to seventy-five. So it's a very rich database. And we used both enrolled people and outsiders which were trying to hack the system. We, ha we, we got excellent results, and I'm talking about authentication results of 98%. And we managed to get a signature which is, was stable both in time and, and also under changing conditions. Next step was scalability. Okay? We want to show that this project can go and identify millions and billions of people. How do you do that? Well, the company completed a study which calculates the quality uh, of the unique features using the entropy theorem. What this, from the study, we, show, we showed that our features and our signature actually contains 60 bits of information. That means that we can potentially distinguish between two in the power of 60 of different people. Just to compare this, the same study which did the same calculation on face recognition got about 40 bits for face recognition. So you, you, can, you can see that this technology has a lot of potential and a lot of information inside these strained eye movement patterns. But it's more than identification. What do I mean? The company has developed features which were found unsuitable for identification. But they give us indication about other parameters. For example, stress, fatigue, drunkness, intoxication, drug use. So this actually means that while I'm identifying you, I can say some more. I can say, for example, if you're drunk, I can say if you're tired, I can say if you're stressed, maybe you have hostile intent intentions. And this is all in the sa on the same process, the same system, at the same time frame. Okay, this is very nice, and it's very academic, maybe, uh, but it's an amazing technology. It's destruct destructive, like you said. It's intriguing, but what's its advantages in taking it into the market? Let's understand these advantages. The IDU technology has advantages both in deployment and performance. It's software-based. The heart of the system is its algorithm and software. Actually, all you need is any kind of display, and a simple camera. So we're talking about something that's very cost-effective. It's very easy to install, seamlessly, inexpensive. It's, it does not depend on a specific hardware or machine. It's contactless. Its user interface is, ve is very fr friendly and easy to use. We all know to watch TV. And, of course, it fits many platforms, application, and verticals. And I, I remember one of the people here talking about dual technology. This is exactly a dual technology. It goes both to the military, special ops, and civilian applications. We're talking about financial, special forces, commercial, transportation, critical infrastructure. And I think in any vertical and market you can think about, this technology can fit its demands. In terms of deployment, this technology can be as a standalone, and also it can work under a cloud environment or in a client-server ser setup. When we're talking about a client-server setup, we have the advantage that the end-user unit ha could be very simple. What do I mean? Laptop, PDA, iPad, like somebody just showed here, smartphone, or any specific uh, dedicated unit. What would happen? is the whole processing would be done on the provider. The end, user the end user model will only receive the stimulus, display it on the monitor, and send back the eye movement video to, to the service provider, and therefore give access granted or access denied. So the whole pro process and the whole IP sits in the service provider, while the end user is a very simple, any, any unit you want to use. In terms of performance, you have something here that's very unique. 
I call it spoof proof, and I'll explain. Available biometric technologies are all based on unchanging features. What does that mean? If we'll take the finger, for example, fingerprint is based on patterns on your finger which do not change. Each time you access the system, the system expects to get exactly the same features. And this is the problem, because if somebody reproduces or copies your fingerprint, then they can, they can hack the system and spoof the, the system, and it's no more secure. In, in talking about fingerprint, it's not like a credit card. A credit card, if somebody steals it, you can call in and cancel it. Same with a password. But the finger, if somebody reproduces your finger and uh, uses it, then that's a real problem. You cannot uh, replace your finger, not yet at least. Maybe they're working it in Maf'at on that, but at this, till this day, the, so, so somebody steals your finger, you're blocked in every identification model that uses fingerprint. What do we do that's different? Well, we're a stimulus-based technology. The stimulus is pseudorandom. What do I mean? Each time you come to the system, it's going to give you a different stimuli. Therefore, your response is going to be different. So if s some bad guys want to record your uh, response and use it, it's going to be useless because next time the system is going to display a different <coughs> stimulus and it's going to expect a different response. So your recording is going to be useless. It's like an, the inherent liveness detection is inside the system and it creates a spoof-proof system in that sense. You can think about it as like a hybrid between the single-use password, which is the token where the password changes all the time, and the biometrics, which is something you don't have to carry. Here you have a technology that actually has the advantages of both of them in, in one. Because of this high spoof-proof capability, we have something that works in unsupervised environment. This gives it advantages in many, many markets where there's not a guard and there's not a video surveillance camera, but you still want to allow access to sensitive materials, physical or uh, data. Other advantages in terms of performance, I'm talking about usability. What do I mean? For example, environmental robustness. This technology, since it's not focused on the sensor, and it's not focused on very, very fine details, it's, uh, it can work almost anywhere and under any conditions. It can work in to total sunlight. It can work on, in total darkness using IR illumination. And it can work in very rough conditions. I mean like dirt, noise, sand, and your imagination can take this to many, many places. On the other hand, we're talking about uh, technology which does not need to see your hands, does not really need to see your face. The only th thing we need to see are your eyes, which are all, always looking to the outside world. So this technology c can work with gloves, veils, hats, scarf, even sunglasses, and actually any protection gear you have on you. That's uh, the summary of the technology. It's a, and it's advantages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Sergio's next uh, from France, uh, Sergio Lurio. Uh, far be it for me to advise MAFAT, but uh, if you do uh, start research on uh, replacing fingers, I suggest you use the trigger finger first. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I'm Sergio Loreiro, the CTO of Seclud IT, a French startup about cloud security. So everybody knows what is the cloud, right? So I'm not going to explain, but so I don't want to upgrade right now. <laughs> uh, 
that gives me a, a good example of things that are going on in a cloud infrastructure that you just cannot um, keep up with the pace with the patches, uh, for instance. So we are uh, focusing on infrastructure as a service, right? So it's, uh, we focus on virtual machines that we can accept, access by the internet and we have immediate access for instance, to do biometric uh, um, uh, calculations. And uh, um, it's a fast-growing market, but the problem is that this is an outsourced uh, infrastructure. It's completely virtualized so that it can scale. And uh, as well, it tends to be dynamic. So everybody is using it for small... Um, amounts of time to perform some calculations, to run some tests. So this dynamic um, of the infrastructure does uh, pose a problem on the monitoring of it. So we have to keep up with the pace and track changes on the infrastructure, on the firewall rules, on the role-based uh, model. So that is what Seclo did, does with our product CloudTomate. So the, the, the fact that it's fully automated, we, we achieve cost reduction, we are continuously, so in real time, tracking the changes on your infrastructure, on the security groups that at the end are firewall rules, of the audit of individual machines, and from this setup, the infrastructure setup, we are getting some security metrics so that we know where is the weakest link on the overall infrastructure. And we do it without needing uh, installation of agents on every machine so that it can really be um, quick. We deploy it on a software as a service model if people trust us, right? And uh, if people don't trust us, they can deploy it as a virtual appliance, so they have the, the appliance and they can run the audits they, they want on it. Oh, um, we are three uh, experienced engineers from France, so Matthias that uh, handles the product management, myself, Sergio that uh, handles the technical part and uh, Frédéric that handles the operational part of it. Today we are uh, targeting the users of infrastructure as a service. So we add a security layer on the offers from the public cloud such as Amazon and Rackspace and we, our customers at the end are the people using it. So today there are a lot of software as a service providers, but as well integrators as Accenture, but Capgemini and the other. So in, in terms of positioning, we, uh, we see the, in, this, um, in the right side the um, traditional data center that is evolving uh, towards the cloud. So we want to be the security player among the, um, the public cloud. So these companies here and here are more uh, targeting management issues. We are really 100% focused on security. So we, what have we been doing till now? The, we start to work uh, last year uh, full-time on the fourth quarter of 2009. Uh, then we, we got accepted by the French incubator with some funding. On the end of the year, we, uh, we applied for a patent on March. We have an open source project that shows uh, our expertise on management and security of uh, cloud infrastructure. For instance, we have an encryption script for the, your storage in the cloud. We got the most significant award from the French Ministry of Research on June. 
I'm glad to to announce that if Peno uh, that has more than 25 years of marketing experience has joined us the first of October, so to to prepare the product launch in October, end of October, with the 20 beta testers that uh, were already identified and starting sales on beginning of next year. So today we are here to to get some visibility, to get uh, to do networking, and we are looking for capital as well. And on the other hand, to enhance our strength. So we are uh, we are in a fast growing market. We have a skilled team. We have a product that really answers a, a big problem, and we are ready to launch. So. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to enroll you in our beta test program or to schedule a demo if you want. Thank you very much. Uh, before we have a break, we've got our last startup, uh, which is Whitewater Security, uh, another company from Israel. Uh, if you can come up to the stage, thank you. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. My name is Dovev Levinson. I'm the CEO of uh, Whitewater Security and Checklight from the Whitewater Group, which is a group of uh, cutting-edge Israeli water companies dealing in the area of water security and control. Our mission is to provide water utilities and uh, high-risk facilities with uh, comprehensive technical, technological solutions for um, thank you uh, providing water utilities and high-risk facilities with uh, technological solutions to protect against an ever-growing variety of threats to drinking water. As uh, we all know, terror organizations like Al-Qaeda, for example, are looking for attractive targets and one attractive target could be water facilities. Uh, it could be done either by trying to uh, destroy it physically, but, uh, and more dangerous, using chemical, biological, radioactive materials in order to poison the water. Um, one of our, our main targets is, uh, is to... Um, be able online to detect uh, water contamination events and Dr. Real Bril will uh, present shortly our blue box, our event detection system. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as the web said, my name is uh, Al Brill, and uh, I would like to talk about a product that we already have in the market, which is uh, called Blue Box, and right now it is already tested by the EPA for several projects in the United States. And the idea is to detect, as the web said, online problems in water quality. So, what is actually the challenge? We know that. Most of the modern water systems do have control systems. The problem is that control system in a normal uh, water conveying system can only identify limit violations. 
In the case of water, this is not the challenge. And why? Because we know today that there are at least between six to ten chemicals that you can buy on the shelf in the market that can create con contamination to water and can create hazard conditions without violating the regulating limits of any measurement which is measured according to the specification of the Ministry of Health. So if you take a normal system and you measure pH, you measure conductivity, you measure turbidity, you measure any other measurements which you are forced to measure by the law and someone would like to put something in the water, the normal detection which is based on limits will not create an alarm. And why? As I said, because what we call is water event quality is a situation where the parameters measured behave abnormally without violating the parameters limits. This is the problem. So, how do we do the magic? If you look at very simple metrics, what is good and what is bad, what is common and what is rare. We know that most of the time the system behaves in a normal situation. If you have a system that creates most of the time bad situations, so you have to replace the system. This is not the case. In some situations you have good surprises, for example if your bank account, your bank manager is calling and you are asking to do, uh, you have a deposit of one million dollar, it's a very good event, but it's very rare. The most interesting thing is that when you have a rare event, which is a bad event, and normally this kind of event should be inspected. I'm sure that some of you had the experience to get a very frightening uh, phone call from a credit card asking did you did this transaction yesterday so the question how do they know how do they ask this question and the answer is very simple they have some kind of technology which is based on what is called unsupervised learning which is able to learn your pattern and it is able to know where do you shop what do you do how long you take how many how much money do you spend for each kind of, of purchasing and the idea is that when someone is using your credit, credit card the patterns is not the same. The idea with Blue Box is much like the same. Blue Box is a fraud detection system but for water quality and we combine statistics with expert knowledge. That's the idea. What are the principles of solution? First of all, there is no one magic algorithm. We have more than 25 different algorithms. Some of them are very simple. Some of them are complicated. For some of them, we have proprietary patterns. And each algorithm is robust to detect a very specific thing, but may be totally blind, as, blind for other things. So. The idea is that you combine several what we call filters. And each filter has a prior probability based on what the expert said, but each filter is gaining credit whether he is able to detect or misdetect things over time. So what happens over time is that the actual probability of each filter is changing based on the performance. It works much like we call it a, a defense team in, in a football and the idea is that the calibration is changed automatically using a self-learning system over the time and what you get is you get a specific model for each site and for each uh, water utility. Here you can have an example, a very simple one. So you have a measurement, it's a single variable, we have obviously multivariable uh, example, and what you have is that suddenly you have 
as something that never occurred. So the system learns that something here is weird and you get a, a gray ball and when you click this ball you get details and here the user can classify what he thinks is the situation, whether it's true alarm, false alarm or whether there is another classification. So what happens over the time is the system learns what are the patterns for each site. And when the system learns that a specific situation is defined as a false alarm, so after a specific period of time, it will not create an alarm if a similar situation occurs. So this is the blue box. It's uh, something in the size of a medium chocolate box. This is specifically is located in Jerusalem, and it's a industrial uh, PC which is capable of running in real time the water measurements of something like 24, 25 different location, which is from our experience should be enough to monitor a city in the size of Jerusalem. And we have a very simple graphical interface. Uh, we have, uh, we collect information for very wide ranges of, so of, uh, of sensors. Actually, any analog or digital sensor can be uh, connected to the system and the system can learn the behavior of this sensor. Uh, we generate the baseline automatically. And this is something very important. We don't have to get uh, the knowledge of the user what he thinks is the baseline. Normally we create, the system creates the baseline for each site automatically. Uh, one thing Right now, we are in the middle of a process of evaluating the system by the EPA. The EPA has declared something which is called EPA Challenge. In this uh, uh, program, they generated six uh, data sets from different six locations, and uh, companies are invited to train their systems on these data sets, and then the system is uh, evaluated by the expert of the EPA. So we are right now in the middle of the process, and until now we have quite a good results. Right, thank you. That's the end of the uh, startup presentations. We are.